Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the All Things New podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode. I appreciate y'all for coming in, coming over. I don't know. That doesn't make sense. Anyways, thanks again for listening to another episode. Let's get right into today's episode, which is titled, Is Submission Oppressive? Before I go into my points, I would like to define submission as it is in the Bible from the Greek. The original Greek word is a word that I don't know how to pronounce. Um, Hupotaso. I hope that I did not butcher that and I very well may have, but it's fine. Anyways, this word means to... um, be subordinate to, reflexively to obey, to be under obedience, to be put under, or to to be subdued unto, um, to be subject to, and to be in subjection, um, and then to submit self unto. So that's like the literal Greek definition of this word. Now the usage in the um, KJV, um, this is what the word submission means when it is used in the Bible. It means to be put under, to be subject unto, um, to be subject to, um, to submit oneself to, um, to be in subjection unto, and to be subjection under. So this word submission is like, it's been, especially recently, it's been a very like controversial word um, because I think that it is largely misunderstood especially by feminism, particularly radical feminism. You could argue that they're the same thing, but that's not what this episode is about. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But the idea of submission is, you know, it's like, oh, goodness, like, don't submit to someone. Like, you are the same and you don't need to submit, blah, 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 blah. Like, why would a woman ever submit to a man, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like, why would you submit or obey to your husband? Like you're your own person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Ultimately, obviously, these people, which unfortunately some of them do come from a biblical worldview, but a lot of them are not coming from that perspective. However, unfortunately, it seems recently that more and more Christians have been rejecting this idea or trying to rewrite their own story of what submission actually means, opposed to the actual Bible, and they want to you know, pick things out and make it sound good or make it sound politically correct. Um, And that's just not the Bible. Like you don't fit the Bible to culture. You need to adjust your culture to fit the morality of the Bible. Even if it's a subculture, even if it's the culture of your home, for example, we should not be trying to mold the Bible to fit our culture because culture changes But one thing that does not change is the word of God and is the character of God. And so that's not something that we should be changing or trying to manipulate to appease ourselves, to appease our ego and to make ourselves feel better, to um, kind of get away from feeling convicted or get away from being selfish. That was a massive tangent I just went off of. But... Now, nowadays, submission is like this thing that's looked at very negatively. Um, And it is something that God has um, made to be like, he's ordained it as this way of being. It's like, I don't want to say hierarchy, but it it is. It's not a hierarchy of um, dominion or like domination, but it's his design and it's a good design. So I would like to read a couple of passages um, in the New Testament that talk about submission. And I'm going to start in Ephesians chapter 5, which is a very common space um, where submission is usually talked about. And when people bring up submission, they usually go to Ephesians 5 because it is talking about the godly relationship between a husband and wife and its parallel to Christ's love for his bride. I'm going to read verses 18 through 33, so bear with me. And verse 18 says, actually, you know what? I'm going to start with verse 15. So sorry, I'm reading even more. Um, Okay, verse 15 says, 
See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, and which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another in the fear of God. So I wanted to start there because it talks about how we should submit to one another as believers um, in the fear of God, that this is something that we should just do as Christians generally. Then in verse 22, it goes on to talk about marriage and how that is a reflection or it should be a biblical godly marriage is a reflection of Christ's relationship with his bride, the church. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That little verse right there, verse 31, is a um, quotation of a verse in Genesis. And then verse 32 says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So usually when submission is brought up, it's um, talking about like wives and husbands specifically. And that's not the only context in which submission is discussed in the Bible. It's also, as I mentioned in one of the earlier verses, how as believers we should be submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. But when it comes to a relationship between a husband and a wife, between a man and a woman, husband and a wife, the way that the Lord has designed it is that the man is the head as Christ is the head of the church and the wife is to submit as the church submits to Christ. And I really love, like after it talks about these roles, after it talks about these purposes, it says, it talks about how much Christ loves his church, how much he loves his bride. It says like, he like, so it says Christ, husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And then it says, husbands, love your wives as your own body. I love how here this idea of submission is for holiness. It's not so that a man can say, I'm above you, do what I say. No. It's so that sanctification happens. And of course, a man is sanctified too. But it's this parallel here is really, really cool. And I think that this sanctification is tied along with humility. Because you cannot submit if you are not humble, if you're not humble in your heart. And if you proclaim that you are submitting, but you're not humble, that's not true submission. You're just fooling yourself. Um, but... It also says here, I love it, it says, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. And the Lord is, like Paul is writing here, but he's saying like, husbands, this is how you should love your wives. You should be nourishing her. You should be loving her as you love 
yourself. You should be cherishing her. It says it cherishes like for the Lord. Well, it says no one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. The head of the relationship is to love and protect and to cherish. And so this relationship here is very beautiful and it is it is for protection and also for sanctification. And it is to show us what Christ's relationship is with his bride so that we can be more like him, but also understand where like where he's coming from like his love for his bride as like husbands become more like christ they love their wives like christ loves his church and wives as they submit to their husbands they become sanctified as christ renews the church they become sanctified throughout this relationship as well so this idea of biblical submission is a really cool and beautiful thing if you look into it because people just like to say like they like to look at the verse and say wives submit to your husband and they're like oh my gosh this is so terrible and they like leave it there and it's like can you read the whole chapter please because it is a very beautiful thing here um i also wanted to read colossians 3 verse 18 which you know i'm going to read 18 and 19 it says this is, this is actually titled the christian home and i love that but verse 18 says wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the lord Verse 19 says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. So the head of the relationship, the husband, the Bible literally says not to be bitter towards them. And so if you are like if there is a hypothetical relationship. Where there is a man who is domineering and harsh and mean towards his wife that is not pleasing to the Lord in any way at all because it's hounded in the New Testament. As the husband is the head, he is to protect, to preserve, to cherish, to love, to not be bitter. So that's not God's design. God's design is not for a the head of the relationship, the husband, to domineer over his wife. His design is for the husband to love and cherish his wife and protect her and to be kind to her and to lead her to Christ and to love her as Christ loved his bride. So just with that, I'm not even done. I'm like a third through my notes just like knowing this biblical submission is far from oppressive because it is something that it's a beautiful process that is like sanctifying and it's you know you're becoming closer to christ as you are of course like in a godly relationship the lord is the head and then you guys you know the husband and wife are both in you know in this relationship and the husband's leading his wife the wife is submitting to her husband and it's this beautiful design that god made and it's good because god's not going to create or design something that's bad for you what god creates is good the next passage i'd like to read comes from james chapter 4 and i'm going to read verses 7 through 10 which say therefore submit to god Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, humble, sorry, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So again, this is another idea of submission to God. And it's not to, you know, and it does say like, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, lament and mourn and weep. That is referring to like this conviction of sin. And that's a good thing because as we submit to God, as we draw closer to him, he will reveal these things to us and it will cause a stirring up and within us, an internal stirring, um, which will inevitably, like with that's, that's the conviction of the spirit inevitably which you know you you can feel conviction but that won't always make you change however that conviction is is a, a, a very imperative step in repentance and and making a decision to turn away from sin but this 
verse starts with submit to God, resist the devil, and they'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. It's not this like submit so that you can be controlled. It's like, no, submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. So this is like a relationship here that's going on. And as we submit to God, um, we and re- as we submit to God and resist the devil, the devil will flee from us. And then as we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. So there's like this ebb and flow and this give and take. There's these these parts of this relationship of this cycle. And our part is to submit to God and resist the devil. And God will do the rest for us. And he will cause that conviction to be stirred up in our hearts. And then he will also change us. And at the end of this passage, it says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Another really big, important part of submission is humility as well. But if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will lift us up. He will make us new. He will strengthen us. And the whole purpose of submission is for sanctification, is to become holy, is to become more like Jesus. The next passage I will be reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, and now I will be reading verses 13 through 25, which is a little bit of a long one, but hang in there. It's good stuff. All right, so verse 13 says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh, for this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth? Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return when he suffered. He did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. For himself bore, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This passage is slightly um, odd and it may not be, I mean, it's applicable to the modern day, but um, it specifically talks a lot about servants being submissive to masters, even if they're not good to you, um, because it is a, it is what is honorable to the Lord. And it is um, honestly, like it's something that you share with Christ. And that is an experience that is shared with Christ um, because he became he who knew no sin became um and like no there was no deceit found in his mouth he became sin and he did not fight back in return i don't think that this is saying you should not stand up for yourself however i think that's something that we can extrapolate from this is that if you have a boss for example that's not a great boss um still be kind to them still listen to them because they're your boss um and if you are you know having that good character that's exemplifying fruit of the spirit you will be honoring the lord but also you will possibly be planting seeds um around you to those around you by the way you behave by the way you respond by the way you answer by the way you do things by the way you do your work not by you know being um belligerent or (laughs) just opposing everything that your boss says because they're your boss you know um so this is um definitely something that's applicable and something that can be taken from this even though it may not be servanthood you can apply this to for example a job um maybe a job you don't like maybe a boss that you don't like either i definitely have experience with jobs that i haven't 
liked um, super well. And it was really hard for me to submit to my boss because that was my job and it was hard to do it. But that's a, a very much like a growing experience and, ex- and also, a, once again, an experience of sanctification where the Lord can work on your heart if you, of course, allow him to. And he can help you um, become more patient, help you become more like him in that experience. The next passage that I'd like to read is from 1 Peter as well, but it is from chapter 5, and I will be reading verses 5 through 11. It says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. There's that idea with submission and humility together. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who calls us who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is clearly like the ending of this chapter. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. That would be awkward if it's not. Um, But I love here how it's talking a lot about um, how if we like... um, we humble ourselves and and under the sight of God and this is like something that's honoring to the Lord and the Lord honors humility and humility is absolutely crucial for living as a Christian. You cannot be a Christ, like a true Christian, a true believer, a true follower of Christ and have ego and think that you're better than everything else or think that your will is better than God's or think that you're smarter than God. That's not how this works. You have to submit and yield your will and yield and submit yourself to God. And then he will start working in you. He will start changing your heart. He will start sanctifying you. But humility is really important. And you can't have submission without humility. And without humility and without submission, you can't. Like the Lord, you know, he's not going to force something to happen in your heart. But you have to come with humility before him so that he can start doing that work in you. But it starts with humility. I also wanted to talk about briefly the character of God and the idea of like submission being oppressive. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about God's character because God is good and he wouldn't create something that is, um, if, if it's used the way he designed it, he wouldn't create something that is oppressive. Like that's not the, the intention of submission is not for oppression. It's for sanctification. So I'm going to read really quick Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 through 7, which is very common, but it is when the Lord is speaking to Moses and when the Lord describes himself. It says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. So the part that I want to focus in on is when the Lord is describing himself. He's saying the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, abounding in goodness and truth. The Lord would not create something and like the way, like the way he intended for it to be created. Of course, humans, we, often twist things and we pervert them but the way that the lord created submission and the way that he intended it is for a good purpose he's not going to create something for destruction submission is associated with god's goodness and with humility and with servanthood which the lord honors the lord honors humility and the lord honors servanthood you cannot submit if you're not humble And I also wanted to read really quick the fruit of the spirit, which goes into this again. Everything's all tied in together. It's so lovely. 
Um, it comes from Galatians 5, 22 through 23, which say, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So again, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the fruit of the spirit of God. This is who God is. This is what he's like. And his purpose for submission is not oppressive because that's not who God is. That's not who he, that's not his heart. If we look at the word of God, look at his heart, look at the consistency of, of who he is. And I think oftentimes people look at the Bible and they're like, oh goodness, God is so terrible because he smote this person or did this or did that. We have to like look at the whole picture. We can't just look at this one piece and say, oh, that's what God is. God is evil because he did this. God is not evil. He is the definition of goodness. And if we look throughout the Bible, we see his goodness over and over. And there are consequences for bad behavior, of course, because that's how the world works. But you can see God's goodness written all over the Bible, all over the Old Testament and all over the New Testament. God's goodness is written all over it. And submission is something that he's created and it is something good and beautiful. Biblical submission, so submission, God's way, is designed for protection, edification, and sanctification. Being under submission, God's way, isn't being subject to dominance or evil or control or lack of autonomy, but it is for protection and for sanctification. Submission, God's way, is a um, like a strong, competent leader, like in a marriage, it would be the man that exhibits the fruit of the Spirit in a position of leadership, leading those under submission closer to the Lord and also exemplifying God's character as they are leading. If your leader is not exemplifying the fruit of the spirit, they're not exemplifying those characteristics that the Lord has. You know, like, of course, everyone, we we all have things we can work on. No one's perfect. But if your leader is leading Like, let's say hypothetically in a marriage, if the husband is leading the wife through a place of fear, a place of domination, and a place of control, that is not biblical. That is not God's design. God's design is for a leader to lead his wife in love and kindness and gentleness and self-control. This is God's design for submission. And this is true biblical submission. This is not the world's idea. This is not domination. This is not control. This is God's idea and design for submission which is for the betterment of the family as a whole but ultimately like this this idea this type of relationship exemplifies god's love christ's love for his bride which is so incredibly beautiful because if we look at the new testament we see how much he sacrificed for his bride he literally laid down his life for his bride and he calls biblical leaders biblical husbands to do the same thing for their families to lead to protect to love not to dominate not to control not to demean that's the exact opposite of what god's design is so god's design for submission is a very beautiful thing and ultimately um if you are in god's will if you're walking with the lord being led by him then it'll ultimately result in sanctification and looking more like Jesus. That is all I've got for today, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, I may do another episode related to submission just because it's kind of a hot button issue these days. Um, But I figured I'd talk about it because it's something that I find interesting, but also is largely misunderstood because it's not, you know, it's even misunderstood in the church, which is unfortunate. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about it from a biblical perspective, looking at different verses in the Bible and figuring out exactly what God's design is for it, um, because it is a good and a beautiful thing. And that is not meant for um, domination or for her control, because that is not God's design. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode. If you haven't already, I would appreciate a rating or a review. That would be super gay. It would make me very happy. Um, 
yeah. And if you know someone who could use this or who you think would like the podcast, feel free to share it with them. That would be awesome just to boost listeners so I can get my monetization back, which would be great. It's not what I do this for, but it would be cool. You know, wouldn't mind a little extra, you know, dinero. Anyways, thanks guys again so much for listening. I love y'all and I will talk to y'all next Tuesday. Ciao.